You may begin. Hi, everyone. I just want to wait one moment longer to ensure that participants have had the chance to come. Um, and then I will introduce uh, Dr. Melissa Gibbs, Professor and Director of Aquatic and Marine Biology at Stetson University. Uh, so in just one moment, we'll start. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm Dr. Melinda Hall. I teach in the philosophy department and I help out around the Brown Center. Um, and I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Melissa Gibbs, who is professor of aquatic and marine biology and director of that program. Uh, she's gonna be talking today about her incredible work on armored catfish. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. We're gonna proceed a little bit differently than some spotlights in the past have, have done. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Gibbs will present some of her research, and then I will uh, ask a few questions that I have prepared um, to uh, engage and initiate some discussion. And during that time, if you would like to ask Dr. Gibbs a question, please uh, write in the chat and I'll begin to weave those questions in. And after a few minutes of guided discussion, I'll open it up to the whole group for more casual and uh, natural. Uh, discussion. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, take it away, uh, Missy. Uh, Missy. All right. Well, thank you, Melinda. Let me share my screen now. Okay. So yeah, I called this file bad fish. Um, but these are, uh, these are an armored catfish um, that we've been seeing in, in the Blue Spring Run for the past 20 years. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the impacts of this invasive armored catfish um, on the Spring Run, some of the things that we've been doing over the years and some of the things that we're doing right now. So I wanted to start off first by just making sure that everybody understood the differences between uh, invasive species, native species, exotic species, um, so an invasive species really is um, something that uh, is capable of growing really quickly. They tend to reproduce when they're young rather than having a very long um, generation time, produce a lot of offspring, and are usually pretty tolerant of a wide variety of conditions. So they can tolerate things that other species might not be able to do so well in. They also are capable of doing ecological harm. This doesn't mean that these are all um, non-native species. They can be things that are native to the continent or native to the area, but still have these types of characteristics. Um, if they're not from the area, then we also could call them exotic. So they could be exotic and invasive. So an exotic species is one that um, is unlikely to have made it here uh, under its own steam. So usually some sort of human intervention uh, brought the species to the area. So a lot of people will ask whether or not we can control invasive species. Uh, it's kind of a hot topic with, um, with certain species like tilapia. You go to Blue Spring during the winter time and you'll see bazillions of them. It's like, well, what can we do about it? Can we control them? Um, unfortunately, with things like tilapia and armored catfish, things that are established, that they've established their populations, they're reproducing well, they are kind of set. Um, so these species that are established in Florida um, cannot be eradicated because there are too many of them and they are found in too many um, different places. So then if we can't get rid of them, um, what can we do about them or can we do anything about them? And um, from the point of view of a biologist, um, an academic, then I'm trying to learn as much as I can about them, about how they live and about what they do in their invaded habitat so that that information can then be used by others to help try to craft some way of, of dealing with this invasive species and dealing with the damage uh, that they may be doing to the environment. So the animal that we are looking at is the sailfin suckermouth armored catfish. It's not exactly a common name that rolls right off the tongue, um, but uh, they're also um, known by their species name, Pterogoplichthes disjunctivus. 
Um, so these guys are fairly good size. They can be up to about two feet long um, and they are heavily armored. Um, they can really uh, do a number on your hands if you're um, grabbing them without, without gloves on. So they're fairly large fish. Um, they're native to Brazil and Bolivia and we think that they got to the U.S. through fish farm escapes and aquarium trade. The first record of them in Florida was actually in the 1950s uh, in the Tampa Bay area. So it's taken quite a while before they got over to our side of Florida. We started seeing them in Blue Spring. Um, well, actually, they had been seen in Blue Spring the year before um, Dr. Work and I started working in the springs, and somebody saw three of them there. Uh, and from then, they kind of uh, took off. They're now found all around the world, everywhere from Asia, Africa, um, of course, they're still in South America and uh, North America. Um, they are um, algebores, so they eat algae, uh, but they also will eat detritus, which is kind of like the gunk that you would just find at the bottom um, of a spring run or a pond or something like that. So it'll be organic material, but not necessarily algae. Um, they also are known for digging some pretty extensive nesting burrows. They um, Females will lay eggs and then the males will guard the eggs until they hatch. So it actually provides a lot of um, protection for, um, uh, for that kind of reproductive effort so that a lot more of those eggs will hatch and the hatchlings then have a better chance. This picture was taken in Texas, uh, but you can see all of these uh, large burrows. Um, so a bank might be kind of pockmarked with um, the sheer numbers of burrows. So what I'm going to tell you now is what we've learned, um, what Stetson biologists have learned about these catfish over the past 20 years, because there really wasn't much known about them uh, before we started um, doing research. I mean, there were publications on them uh, written in Portuguese in Brazil, uh, but that was really it. We had trouble finding uh, any information about them. So I'm just going to go through, I think I've got like five things that we have uh, discovered, that they are, um, they're air breathers, um, which means they, um, they're they actually using a mod their modified stomach to breathe air. They don't have a lung or anything, but they can go up to the surface um, and they can take a big gulp of air, kind of swallow that into the stomach and then go back down to the surface um, and hang out down there for, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes. So obligate air breathing just means that in the spring run where the oxygen levels are extremely low, um, they have to breathe air. Um, and so you'll see them coming up to the surface, these kind of little wet gaspy noises they'll make as they take a gulp. Um, but their ability to survive in a place like a, the spring run, in a place that has essentially no oxygen, is just one example of their tolerance of um, harsh conditions that might kill quite a few other species of fish. And just to give you an example, so the spring run has oxygen levels um, that are all generally less than one milligram of oxygen per liter of water. Um, most fish will die if they're exposed to anything less than three milligrams of oxygen per liter. So this is a very low oxygen stressful environment. And yet there are fish um, that tolerate this just fine. Fish that are adapted to it, that are native fish, and fish like these armored catfish that are um, unpleasantly able to do well in, uh, in these types of environments. Um, catfish also harass manatees, and this is something that a lot of people notice when they go to the springs during the, the winter time, and you can see all of these catfish uh, glommed on to the manatees, and what they're doing is they're um, rasping the algae off of the manatee's skin. The manatee's skin is rough, and so the algal cells uh, will proliferate there. So uh, this doesn't actually hurt the manatees. They're not biting them or leaving raw spots or anything like that. But what we found is the catfish were inducing pretty significant changes to the manatee's behavior, and I'll show you that on this next slide. So if you look at the figure on the left, these are all different manatee behaviors, and the first four, A through D, are all pretty low energy activities. They're not doing a lot, resting, nursing, walking along the bottom. Um, e and F are a little more active, and then G through J are much more 
um, active behavior, swimming faster, doing a barrel roll, things like that. And when we did this study, we ranked all of these behaviors according to how um, active they were. And then we filmed the manatees and this lower um, graph shows you that manatees that did not have catfish attached to them tended to have fairly low levels of activity. Um, but in the upper graph, you can see that those manatees that had catfish attached were much more active. Um, and this is a problem in the wintertime because uh, manatees are not very tolerant of cold weather. They can die of cold shock. These rather rotund bodies um, actually have no insulation. There's no blubber in there. That's all intestines and skin and bones and things like that. So the manatees come into the spring run to get warm in the winter time, but there's nothing to eat in the spring run. And so they have to go out into the river to feed um, some more. So it, it's really beneficial to them to stay very, very quiet in the spring run and conserve all their energy. And that means they don't have to go out into the river as often to feed. But if they're burning a lot more calories like they are with catfish on them, then they're gonna, they are going to have to go out there and feed more frequently, which puts them at risk. Uh, we did a, uh, an analysis of catfish growth, and we found that they are very fast growing. They can grow about 10 centimeters a year. And what this really means is that uh, even though they are vulnerable to uh, a lot of predators when they're small, they grow quickly enough that they pretty much outgrow the predators um, and also are reaching reproductive age uh, very quickly. Um, and uh, this figure just shows you the body length and then this otolith estimated age. Over on the right is a fish otolith or ear stone. And um, estimating the age is like reading tree rings. So you can see the um, the rings or bands here where there's a number one, that is the marker for the end of the first year of growth. And then you go out to this number two and there's another set of bands and that's the end of the second year of growth. So we did this with uh, about maybe like 600 or something um, otoliths and we're able to figure out a, a pretty tight relationship of fast growth. Um, they also have been getting a lot better at reproducing every year, which is pretty alarming. We did our first uh, reproductive analysis in 2008, and then we re repeated this 10 years later. Um, and when we compared our two sets of data, we found that the females were, get, were becoming capable of spawning at smaller sizes, which meant at younger ages. Um, and the fecundity, or the, the measure of how um, of how many eggs they're able to produce, that was increasing during each reproductive season. And this image here just shows you a, a, a pair of ovaries um, with all of these uh, large mature oocytes there. So they're getting better at reproducing. There were a number of other measures that also indicated this was, uh, was the case. So that's not good news for the native fish. And then we found that there was catfish poo everywhere. So here we've got this nice picture of a couple of armored catfish uh, in the spring run, the fallen logs and all of that. And all those red rings are circling areas where there is catfish poo. Uh, it is everywhere. There was a lot of it and that was kind of intriguing. Once you know what it looks like, then you start seeing it absolutely everywhere. Um, here is a channel catfish, a native catfish species, um, and we would find no matter where we looked, whether it was near an armored catfish or a native fish, we were still seeing um, the armored catfish poo. It was persistent, and it was everywhere, it was really obvious. And this uh, poo, I should mention, is um, one of the f uh, very few types of um, fecal material that will uh, stay in the spring run. It's, there's a fair amount of sand in it, so it's weighted down. It's kind of encapsulated a little bit, so it stays put. We've watched other fish like tilapia poo, and you get this cloud of, of fecal material. It, it's not something that sinks down to the bottom, so this is distinctive. And so the catfish poo study was born. 
Um, this has been one of the more fun things to tell people about. We'll be out in the spring run collecting data and someone says, what are you doing out there? And we can tell them, well, we're collecting poo and it gets really quiet. Um, so we have our poo crew um, with the lettering written in coils of catfish poo. Um, but this is actually a very interesting study and it is telling us a lot about what's happening um, in the spring run. So here's what we did. Um, we started doing this in uh, 2008 and we've continued um, on and off um, through 2020 or 2020. So we divided the spring run into grids, about roughly 10 meters square so that we could kind of systematically um, sample the spring run and try to assess how much poo is actually there in the entire spring run. Uh, every now and then we had a little interference. Uh, this was last fall with one of my students. Um, we were trying to, to do our sampling and occasionally we would get a young manatee um, kind of uh, getting involved trying to figure out what we were doing. This one was very interested in her shoelaces and occasionally we would have members of the public who uh, would pick up some of our, our gear, but uh, it still was, was quite a fun uh, experience. So what we would do um, is within each grid, we would toss three weighted flags, and that's what you see with this orange flagging. There's a cork on the end of it and a lead weight at the other end. Toss them kind of randomly within our 10-meter grid, and then wherever that flagging um, landed, we would put a quadrat next to it and then we could take um, some video with a GoPro uh, and then process uh, that, uh, that footage and get an image out of it. So here we've got our quadrat and you can see that there is a scale bar. Um, this is 10 centimeters long so we could utilize that to kind of uh, collect our, our measurements. So the first thing we had to do was look at this uh, image and identify everything in it that was poo. And there's the poo marked in red. Um, so there uh, is quite a lot of it in some images and not so much um, in the others. But we would have a little uh, device that kind of looks like the, you know, when they're um, measuring out distances after a traffic, traffic accident, there's this device with a little wheel on it and you can roll that along and measure things. Well, they've got them um, that are made for architects and so we can use that and kind of um, run that along the length of each piece of poo uh, and then compare that to our 10 centimeter scale here and get a real measurement um, of poo. Um, we also um, looked at the poo over time. This isn't all the same um, view of the poo, but it shows you three different or four different um, kind of ages of poo. We want Kind of were curious about how long the poo even lasted in the spring run. I mean, if it they poop and it's there for a day or two and then it's gone, that would be interesting. If it lasts for weeks, that would be interesting. And it does seem that it's lasting for weeks. So the uh, quadrat A is fairly new, poo B is a little bit older, C and D it's starting to get covered with um, with algae, um, and you know in D you. You can't see a lot of it, but you can kind of see the um, outline of the, the shape that's kind of underneath the, the algae. So we know it lasts for a while and we know there's a lot of it. But why does anyone care if there's a lot of catfish poo in the spring run? I mean, what, what's the big deal? Um, the big deal is that we know that nutrients, like uh, the nutrients you'd find in fertilizer, nitrates and phosphates, are leaching uh, or leaking essentially out of the, uh, the fecal material. Um, so that there's a fair amount of the nutrients coming out and there's a lot of the, the poo that's um, in the spring run, even after the fish uh, themselves have left. If we look at those fecal samples, we know that um, there are still live algal cells in there, um, plus the nutrients, plus they're weighted down with sand. Um, and we know that when we looked at the amount of algae um, in the quadrats, there was a correlation with the amount of algae and the amount of poo that was there. So we kind of came to the conclusion that these fecal strands were kind of nutrient bombs. Um, the catfish uh, deposited them, they sat there, weighted down with the sand, they lasted for two weeks, and nutrients were coming out of them the whole time. And um, 
those live algal cells and algal abundance all indicate that the, um, the fecal material actually is kind of seeding um, algae into the, the spring run. So that's not a good thing in a body of water where there's already a lot more algae and there already is a lot of anthropogenic uh, fertilizer getting into the system. And again, even though individual uh, feces may not be releasing that much in the way of nutrients, if you add it all up uh, in the spring run, then you do get a lot. So the uh, original assessment of the volume of poo in the spring run um, was about 3.1 times 10 to the fifth cubic centimeters. Um, our most recent estimate of poo volume is more than three times that. Um, as we add in more data, that might change a little bit, but these black dots are the new data, the open circles are the old data, and there is more poo out there now than there was um, 10 years ago. So these um, areas of fecal deposition uh, are creating what we would call a transient biogeochemical hotspot. Um, and these are areas where you have um, more of the nitrates and phosphates and carbon than you might normally have. So it's a hot spot or a, a collection of this, um, of this material. And these biogeochemical hot spots may end up changing the normal way that nutrients are, are cycling throughout the spring run. And nutrient cycling is just the movement of nutrients um, through the life cycle of the run. So um, raw materials into plants, plants eaten by the herbivores, herbivores eaten by the carnivores, carnivores eaten by other carnivores, animals dying, um, decomposing, and the raw materials being available again. So you have a normal pattern, um, but these hot spots may be changing that pattern. So then the question is how could these catfish nutrients um, really be affecting the, the balance of the, the spring run? And it's important to remember, you know, with a, any ecosystem that um, it developed and evolved over long periods of time with conditions being fairly stable. And so everything is really in balance um, that uh, if you, if you, um, interfere with that balance, it's hard to predict what might actually happen to the ecosystem. <clears throat> so these catfish we know could be regulating the standing crops or the normal amount of algae in the spring run, that if you have increased numbers of catfish and they're pooping all over the place um, and that is leading to an increase in algae, um, that may begin changing the amount of algae or even the species of algae um, that are living in the spring run. And that's going to affect um, other animals in the, the spring ecosystem, whether they be eating algae or eating the things that live in the algae. Um, the cat aren't just eating and then pooping out nutrients that are in the spring run. We know the catfish are going out into the river and then coming back into the, the spring. And we know this um, because we know how, about how much poo a catfish produces. And we see a lot more poo in the spring run than we see catfish during the daytime. So the catfish seem to be coming in at night, feeding and pooping in there and then going back, back out um, into the river. Um, and certainly it's not a, um, a bad thing to have nutrients um, in a spring run or any body of water. Um, but the, the thing that we're worried about here is if there's a, dr a dr dramatic change in the balance of nutrients, whether it be um, you know, nitrogen to phosphorus to, uh, to carbon or the amounts of them, things like that. So a change is not necessarily a good thing. Um, and just to give you an example of the types of things that we look at, as we look at species um, and the, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus they have um, in their bodies. And so we'll talk about the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus um, in their body. And those that have low ratios of nitrogen relative to phosphorus are consuming more phosphorus um, and keeping it in their bodies and releasing more nitrogen than would a species that has a higher nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. So um, just kind of keep that in mind that we're, we're interested in these ratios. Um, and it's not just that species can have different ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus, 
um, but some systems might be very low in nitrogen, so they might be limited in nitrogen, so that the one thing that might limit the development of some plants um, in the system could be the, uh, there not being enough nitrogen there. Others are very low in phosphorus, and so the system um, may not kind of blossom as much as it would if you added some extra phosphorus in there, much like if you were fertilizing um, your lawn and you might pick different types of uh, commercial fertilizers that have different ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, and um, what I think potassium. So like 666, that's pretty uh, even amounts of those three um, nutrients. So if you have a system that might be low in nitrogen or phosphorus, and you might be adding in a species that has a very different um, nitrogen to phosphorus ratio compared to native species, like an exotic species, that could dramatically change what's happening um, in the spring system. So what is it about these armored catfish that made us think that they could be having an impact um, on the spring system? Uh, what's so different about them? Why couldn't it just be that there a large number of uh, native fish coming in there could cause a problem? Um, it turns out that the armored catfish are pretty different. Um, and one difference is that they're armored. They've got all these bony plates um, and bone contains a lot of phosphorus. So very bony fish or fish with bony armored plates are going to be taking in more phosphorus, retaining more phosphorus, and egesting or pooping out um, less phosphorus than other fish would. So the question that we're asking right now, um, this is with me and, and um, Dr. Work and Dr. Tristano, is whether catfish are using or sequestering, keeping inside, or producing nutrients differently than other fish. We know about the poo from our poo nutrient analysis, but we don't know yet about how the nutrients are distributed in their bodies and how that compares to native species. Uh, we're actually expecting there to be a low uh, nitrogen to phosphorus ratio in these guys. So here's, um, I know this looks like a bunch of little vials of maybe the types of um, pepper flakes you might use uh, at a pizza parlor or you know fancy herbs and spices, but these actually are ground up, dried up bits of armored catfish, bluegill, and uh, mosquito fish. So we're looking at these three different species, two native species, bluegill mosquito fish, and then the catfish. And we're um, looking at the uh, carbon and nitrogen and the phosphorus um, data. We've already gotten the carbon and nitrogen results back from a lab, and now we're using our um, auto analyzer in the aquatic lab to measure um, the amount of phosphorus. And the next step then will be to calculate the ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus um, in the catfish and in the native species. We will also be able to look at the uh, different tissues in the catfish. You might be able to see on these lids, this is C7S, that's the skin, C3M for muscle, and um, well, I don't see a bone one here. Uh, but those, we looked at bone, muscle, and skin for the catfish, and then we have the mosquito fish and the, the bluegills. So is this analysis of nutrients going to solve the um, excess nutrient problem in the spring run or the issue of an armored catfish? Well, no. Um, but the more we know about the impacts they're having, in the spring run, then the better we can understand the system as a whole, and then we can try to mitigate the effect of the armored catfish. Um, remember that the armored catfish are established, they're here to stay. So if we can't get rid of them, we have to come up with ways of improving things for the native species and the ecosystems that um, are still here and may be struggling to survive. So we can go after the anthropogenic impacts, we can control those. So we can control how much um, fertilizer is getting into freshwater, uh, freshwater bodies. We can do better at conserving our freshwater resources, um, protecting the uh, habitat. Uh, for the manatee, it'd be having the manatee speed zones. And you might think, well, how on earth could manatee speed zones um, help them deal with armored catfish? Um, but it can. If you take away one stressor from the manatees, then they're much more able to deal with 
another stressor. And of course, there's still a lot of people releasing aquarium fish um, all over the place. So we might be able to prevent other invasive species from, uh, from getting into Florida's waterways. So that's kind of the, uh, the study in a nutshell um, that my, my colleagues, um, Kirsten Work and Liz Tristano, Liz is one of our uh, Brown scholars this year. A lot of um, students doing their senior research or just wanting to be out in the springs collecting data. Uh, everyone has helped with uh, data analysis and then the Park Service, the Water Institute and the um, summer grant program for, um, for funding. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Missy. That was really uh, cool to hear. Oh, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback again, so I'm hesitating over my words. Sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, I have a few different questions to kind of get us kicked off, and I I think some of them are maybe a little. I think the idea of a poo study makes you reach for those kind of out there questions, but I'll start with the more reasonable one. Um, and then if people could add any questions that they have to the chat, I'll begin to weave those in until we can open out into more general discussion. Um, so one thing that I immediately thought was really interesting was the question of balance. You talked about nutrient balance between nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus. And in some of my work in environmental ethics, you know, I've noticed the way in which the question of ecosystem balance is really not in vogue. In other words, we don't think there's a steady state really for um, nature for a particular environment or ecosystem. Uh, but in a sense, it kind of sounds as though you found another sort of place where balance is good between those three nutrients. Is, is that right? Is that an accurate take on, on part of what you found? Sorry, I forgot that you muted me. Um, but yeah, even though um, ecosystems are not really static, they still are, um, I think, naturally balanced at any time, right? So that um, the, the big thing in environmental um, systems is that you don't want to have abrupt changes. Um, abrupt changes are not normal. Um, or even if you do have an abrupt change as, an, as a volcanic explosion, that is natural, um, but it's an unusual occurrence and it's going to have a, a dramatic effect on the environment. So the invasive species are behaving like an abrupt um, disturber of the of the ecosystem. So that I think is why the nutrient issue uh, can be a problem is that these species have not evolved to deal with rapid change. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and I was thinking more about um, your choice to use a tool from architecture. Could you say more about that, how that worked, that you sort of discovered that this architectural tool became really helpful for measuring poo? Is that the way that a lot of folks approach that measurement? Or This is um, actually one that, that Kirsten um, came up with. So here's, you can see the little, this little device with a little wheelie thing on it. And it's actually really useful to use it like a pen and kind of draw and outline um, the pieces of, of poo. And I, I get a measurement on there and I can see the measurement. And then I, I measure the, um, my 10 centimeter scale bar. And then I can convert that into um, a real measurement. So um, I don't, I didn't know that they existed, but um, but that's what collaborators are for, is that we all have different things that we can contribute to a project. And uh, Kirsten and I have been working together for 20 years, um, and it's been a, a really good collaboration. The whole That's great. And that goes to one of my other questions about your sort of significant collaboration. You do a lot of collaboration with students. You do a lot of collaboration with your colleagues. And so I was curious, sort of, what are some of your favorite parts about working with those individuals in the spring run? Yeah, I've, I love collaborating. I mean, it, it's, it's not just having um, the extra pairs of hands that you need to have to do field work. Um, but it's also just the collegiality of it. It's the, the different expertise. I'm primarily an ichthyologist, a fish biologist, um, and Kirsten has a lot more expertise in ecology. 
um, and modeling and things. And she's also better at stats. Terry has been very helpful with statistical analysis and so has um, Cindy Bennington. And so we can all kind of put together our different types of expertise to um, make a much more interesting kind of study. For example, with the poo, I started noticing the poo out there and really getting intrigued by it and thinking, ooh, I wonder how much is out there. And then Kirsten uh, starts thinking of ways that we can put that information into a framework that'll let us look at um, food webs in the, in the spring run. And we brought in a, a Brown fellow who has expertise with analyzing the nutrients. And it's just a lot more fun than doing something totally on your own because you can bounce ideas um, off. And it's great fun working with the students. They love being out there uh, in the So it sounds like some of the developments in the past few years at Stetson have positively impacted your work. So the Brown Center development, and then also the, you mentioned that you're using the wet lab at the Aquatic Center to look at those tissue samples. Oh, you're not, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, you're not, oh, okay. Yeah. So we're, uh, we have a, our aquatic lab here in Sage Hall. So that's just the aquatic research lab. And so we've got an, a nutrient analyzer that was purchased uh, jointly by uh, chemistry, environmental science, and biology. Um, but the uh, Water Institute has provided um, some seed grants that we've used to get some of our samples analyzed. And of course, Stetson summer grants um, that have helped to fund some of this research. And then um, our Brown fellow, whom uh, we've had a, a Brown scholar in, in SAGE for, in biology for, boy, maybe 10 years, maybe not quite that long, but for quite a while. And so um, it was our turn this time to, to get one that could uh, uh, help us with. So, um, <laughs> Terry would like to know is, <laughs> No, I, I won't include that, but what kind of family business? Um, I think the collaboration is just wonderful, and I'm really glad that um, you all do that, and it's really cool to hear about. Um, and so I'll just sort of selfishly ask one more question, and then, oh, and then Harry has one as well. Um, my question actually came from your sort of overall description of your project and, and some of the work that you're doing comparing anth anthropogenic effects. I'd love to like hear a little bit more about the idea that the impact of the fecal matter from the armored catfish or sort of uh, other similar species that one might imagine could be as deep or lasting as anthropogenic effects. Obviously, I've already pointed to the fact that, well, we can control our impact. But I think we're used to thinking that we as a species are the ones who sort of do evil or have bad impacts. And now we're seeing, you know, how does that change the balance of that imagined gulf between human beings and our sort of evil quote unquote impacts on the climate versus animals and their neutral or benign impacts. Um, so my question is really about, yeah, the idea that, that this could be just as impactful as anthropogenic impacts on the blue spring run. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the grand scheme of things, of course, it, humans are still going to be having the most dramatic harmful effects on, on natural systems. But I, the, the idea that um, animals can have truly devastating, or maybe devastating too strong a word, but they can have really powerful impacts on ecosystems. And I, I think that um, there are in some invasive species where we just, just hasn't occurred to us what they could be doing. Um, and just imagine, you know, if Blue Spring wasn't as clear as it was, we wouldn't be seeing all the poo in there. You know, once you start seeing it, it's like spinach linguine everywhere. It's all over the place. Um, but if that was darker water, we wouldn't see it. Maybe we wouldn't know that they were contributing so much um, nitrates and phosphates to the ecosystem. So. Um, and not only that, you know, with fertilizer, human fertilizer, human applied fertilizer, um, that tends to be seasonal, but the catfish um, are not that seasonal anymore. Um, so they may be producing um, nutrients in the spring run all year round, and the humans are only adding, you know, fertilizing their lawns maybe in the, in the springtime and maybe in the summertime, something like that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> 
So I have two questions in the chat, and actually given the timing of these, I'd love to just open out to a more general discussion and invite folks to unmute themselves and show their screens. Um, so first I have a question from Harry and then a question from Corey. Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to read the questions, Missy. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, oh, I'm, that, I'm happy to do that. I was thinking that given the timing of your question, I might invite you to do so, but that's okay. Um, I, you're asking about harvesting the catfish. If yeah. there's anything can, that can be done to convert their bodies into a value added product. Um, is that something that you do, Missy? Uh, share them out to the campus or anything like that? Yeah. Um, no, um, these catfish um, go become one with the woods. Um, so after we have taken whatever specimens we need, um, then the um, the park rangers um, take them into the woods, and they take the big nap um, in the woods. There, um, I did read about um, this was years ago. Um, some people were trying to use the catfish as a way of making like fish meal, you know, using a uh, wood chippers and grinding them up. But but these are really big fish, and um, I, it clearly was not a very cost effective way of of dealing with the um, with the material. So um, and they they do uh, get hung up in um, nets and things like that. So they're not uh, you know, easy to, to haul out in a more commercial way. I mean, we're catching them one at a time with pole spears. Um, so finding a way of getting them in a large enough scale to be useful would also be probably be difficult. So. Be interesting to get the honors students or another group on that with one of their projects to find a way to use the body. Yeah, the, of course, like I said, the problem with, you know, it's one thing to for me to be using them, catching them in the spring run, but uh, catching them in a state park means that they actually can't be used for anything else um, that, that's commercial. And um, catching them in the river is not possible, really, because the water is dark and there's snags and things that would interfere with, um, with nets. So that they're, yeah, there doesn't really seem to be a, a, a good way to to catch them. Although it seems if there was something really useful you could do with them that made them really, really marketable, then people would become motivated to find ways of catching them in places that were acceptable. Um, but sadly, isn't the case. Yeah, kind of like the lionfish. Yeah, like you, the lionfish. You know? That's why I was wondering. Thank you. Absolutely. Right, um, Thank you, yeah, Carrie. And um, Hi, I can, I can, uh, yeah, I can share. I actually just answered my question. So, <laughs> um, so I was kind of thinking of, I was thinking of the lionfish as well and kind of how they've been used as a model for, oh, it's fun, go out and fish them. And if you do it right, you can eat them. Um, but it looks like it's not really a good fishery idea if you can't easily get them outside of areas, right, where you're allowed to fish and then no one wants to eat them, I'm guessing. Um, they actually, people do can eat them. Um, I I was told that that there you know people in um, like the Orlando area who came from um, Central America, that kind of thing, where the fish were found, uh, were making you know curry dishes out of them. The problem is with the um, armor plating, it's very difficult to get into them. I mean, I've got a designated hacksaw that I use to saw them open. Um, I think you kind of have to lop them off um, to get the tail and, and cook that, you know, cook it in the shell. And then you could pick the bits of bony plate out and, and you know, have the meat. But it's a, a lot of work, I think, to get anything uh, tasty out of it. Fair enough. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Terry, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was just going to say, in, in Lake Okeechobee, they catch a lot as a bycatch product when they're fishing for other stuff. And, you know, they were trying to give them away to alligator farmers to feed alligators because they basically had to bring them back to dockside. They couldn't release them. And the, even the alligator farmers didn't want them. Um, <laughs> yeah, they are... Uh, 
they're they're kind of ugly as a food item. That's so interesting. Yeah, they, they also so interesting. they also can they can lock their fins out to the side and up on top, so they can make themselves very difficult to to eat as well. They can make themselves bigger seeming than they really are. So I welcome anyone else's comments, I'm sure um, Missy does as well. Um, Terry, do you again have another, would you like to share again? Yeah, Harry or Terry? Oh, either one. I, I thought I saw Terry's hand, it must have been yours, Harry. Terry can go first. No, I'm good. So you've been doing, you. I uh, remember, um, that was quite the uh, accomplishment when you finally, when you, you, you and Kirsten were working on the poo paper, as you would affectionately called it. And that was really quite the accomplishment, right? Because you had been doing this for so many years. Where do you see this going? Uh, are you going to continue or are you going to bifurcate and maybe, you know, look at the armored catfish uh, ecology, if you will, in a different way? Yeah, I think that for the next probably couple of years, we're still going to be working on this, um, the poo stuff, because we also wanted to be, we had planned actually this year before the pandemic to start also looking at um, water flow dynamics in the spring run and um, kind of combining that with where the poo is and um, maybe there are areas in the spring run where there's more of the nutrients the bigger hot spots and smaller hot spots and, and things like that. So we're not really done with the, the poo stuff yet. Um, and I suspect that when we are finished with it, I'll find something else kind of interesting to look at uh, with the armored catfish or maybe, um, you know, move on to um, other uh, native fish in the spring run. Uh, but projects just seem to kind of appear. Um, the more time you spend out there, the more questions then you can you can ask, and then it's fun to figure out a way to actually answer them. Thank you. That's cool. Um, so I do want to invite everyone um, to ask any further questions that they have. And in the meantime, I might just follow up on Harry's question with just one other a uh, thought, you know, visually when you shared the photographs um, of the burrows, I couldn't help but wonder, they're so impactful. I mean, they look really impactful visually. Um, do you have any uh, plans to investigate whether or not those, bur those burrowing behaviors impact on the run? Yeah. Um, I think that they do, um, they're, because they're very clearly that kind of burrow um, can destabilize um, a spring run or destabilize a bank. And so um, this is not something that we have analyzed or anybody that I know has really analyzed, but certainly anecdotally, the park rangers um, have noted a lot more of slumping of the banks along the spring run. Um, that can be due to a variety of causes. I mean, you have a lot of manatees, huge numbers of manatees in there all kind of moving around and the water starts sloshing like in a bathtub and you're going to have some underbank erosion. But if you also have these armored catfish that are burrowing in and, and digging in, um, that is definitely going to add to some erosion issues. And so um, I would expect there to be any place where there are a lot of nest burrows, I would expect there to uh, to be some erosion and that definitely is is not good okay thank you very much i'm not seeing uh further questions so we can let you off the hot seat but thank you so much uh missy for your presentation um and harry do you want to add or maybe the hand is left over okay the hand is left over sorry Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I My internet is also slow, so I'm a little, like, cautious here. Uh, but thank you again very much, uh, Missy, and thank you to all who came. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks, Missy. Thanks, Melinda. Yeah, bye.